NWA Mid-America was a territory under the umbrella of the National Wrestling Alliance that promoted shows in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Alabama from the 1940s until 1981. The company was founded in the 1940s by Nick Goulis and Roy Welsh and was one of the first promotions to join the NWA after it was founded in 1948. From 1953 until late 1974, John Kazana promoted the Knoxville area and Joe Gunther promoted the Birmingham area from around 1940 until some point in the 1970s. In 1977, promoter Jerry Jarrett and wrestler Jerry Lawler broke away from NWA Mid-America, breaking the Memphis area off to start under the name Continental Wrestling Association. Mid-America stopped promoting in 1981 and then the CWA took over most of their territory as well as some of the championships promoted by NWA Mid-America. This is the untold story of NWA Mid-America. It was 1940. Cartoon character Elmer Fudd makes his debut in the animated short Elmer's Candid Camera. Actor and film director Al Pacino is born. Booker T. Washington becomes the first African American to be depicted on a United States postage stamp. The New York Rangers beat the Toronto Maple Leafs 4 2 to win the Stanley Cup. And promoter Roy Welsh started promoting shows on a regular basis in and around Memphis, Tennessee and would later be joined by Nick Goulis, who had been promoting shows in Florida between 1945 and 1947, before joining with Welsh to create the Goulis Welsh Enterprise Inc. Incorporated Company. In the mid-1940s, as they began promoting shows primarily in Memphis and Nashville, with occasional shows in Chattanooga, Jackson, Louisville, Lexington, and even Bowling Green, Kentucky. They also worked with Joe Gunther, a promoter working out of Birmingham, to expand their promotion into Alabama, as well as occasional shows in Mississippi, Ohio, West Virginia, Missouri, Georgia, and North Carolina. In 1949, the group joined the National Wrestling Alliance, a national sanctioning body that divided the U.S. into territories. The promotion became known as NWA Mid-America. By 1953, they added Knoxville, Tennessee to their territory as promoter John Kazana joined the group. The group recognized a number of NWA World Championships that were shared across the territories as well as promoting their own NWA branded championships that were mainly defended in the Mid-America Territory. Stars of the 1950s who worked with Goulas included Tex Riley, Rowdy Red Roberts, Don McIntyre, Farmer Jones, Al Spider Gelanto, Freddie Blassie, Irish Mike Clancy, Corsica Joe and Corsica Jean, Chris Tolos, Joe Scarpa, Dick Bear, Johnny Walker who would later gain fame as Mr. Wrestling 2, Ray Stevens, Don Luke and Lee Fields, Don Kent and Billy Wicks among others, as well as female stars such as Mildred Burke, Lillian Ellison, Mae Young, Cora Combs, Penny Banner, and June Byers were also frequent visitors to Tennessee in the 1950s. Professional wrestling had long been home to individuals who were nothing short of colorful. One of the sport's most flamboyant talents made a name for himself in the territory in the 1950s. His nicknames included The Sweet Man, The Diamond Ring, and Cadillac Man. He was Sputnik Monroe. Not only did Monroe sport a colorful personality, but also a colorful appearance. It was hard not to notice Monroe's cocky swagger and the menacing look on his face, but more often than not what many fans recall was his hair. Monroe had black hair with a blonde streak right down the middle. Especially popular at being unpopular, Monroe long held the attendance record for pro wrestling in Memphis for his 1959 feud with Billy Wicks. Monroe would frequent the area on and off until the early 1980s. His success spawned off a series of relatives, some who would appear for Goulas, all with catchy names such as Rocket Monroe, Jet Monroe, Flash Monroe, and Mars Monroe. None of those could ever match the success of the flamboyant sweet man Sputnik Monroe. I may as well tell you that there are three different and distinct styles of wrestling. The Greco-Roman, the Oriental, and you guessed it, the streamlined modern version which is now being demonstrated. The 1950s also brought the debut of Len Rossi. Len was a superb junior heavyweight originally from New York. 
fans took an instant liking to Len and Tennessee quickly became his home. He worked for Goulas until a car accident in 1972 cut his career short. After that, he often appeared as a TV commentator for Goulas in Nashville. Saul Weingroff also debuted for Goulas in the 1950s. Many longtime fans consider Saul to be one of the best ringside managers they have ever seen. Saul had a knack for annoying the fans to the point where they wanted to clobber him with their own hands. Saul debuted as a wrestler for Goulas but received greater fame as a manager, managing such heel teams as Kurt and Carl Von Brauner, The Spoilers, and Tojo Yamamoto and Professor Ito among others. Saul's most successful run in the territory was with the German team of Kurt and Carl Von Brauner. The two bald-headed grapplers worked the territory for many years. Their rough tactics and anti-American rhetoric, coupled with Weingroff's constant complaining and interference with his trusty cane made them arguably the most disliked trio ever ever to appear for Goulas. Saul is also well remembered for his many verbal battles with TV announcers, most especially Chattanooga's Harry Thornton. Saul and the Von Brauners worked for Goulas into the 1970s and also enjoyed success in other territories. By the way, Saul, what's in the bag? I don't think it's your business. I don't think it's anybody's business because that's what's going to win us the title. That's what's in that bag. Don and Al Green, the original Heavenly Bodies, became one of the longest-running tag team combinations anywhere when they began working for Goulas. Together they were a rough heel team who worked on and off for Goulas until the 1970s, holding at one time or another all three major area tag team championships. In the early 1970s, they added Englishman Sir Stephen Clements and his ever-present umbrella as their manager. Later, they were briefly managed by Rock Riddle. Since the territory was so full of good tag teams, the Greens ended up facing most of them as they all passed through from the late 1950s until the early 1970s. Over time, Don turned into a fan favorite while Al formed a team with Phil Hickerson and became a ringside manager for Goulas. Don and Al weren't really brothers, although the resemblance is striking. Don's real name is Don Green, while Al's real name is Al Denny. Millis, old boy, it'll take more than fast talk to save you now. Under any rules, Greco, Roman, catch as catch can, or what have you, you're out. It's a fall, and you're the fall guy. Jackie, Don, and Sonny Fargo all made debuts for Goulas in the 1950s. In various combinations, the fabulous Fargos also held the area's major tag team titles. Don became the traveler of the three and appeared all over the world, often under different ring names. Sonny stuck closer to home and eventually became a referee for Jim Crockett's Mid-Atlantic promotion in the late 1970s and early 1980s. He would return in the 1970s as Jackie and Don's crazy brother from Rough House Fargo, nicknamed Nuthouse. Jackie also mainly stuck to Tennessee, although he did have a stint for Jack Pfeiffer and held Pfeiffer's version of the world title. Jackie eventually settled into working for Goulas and became Nick's biggest attraction until both he and Nick retired. Jackie's Fargo strut, whether originated by him or someone else, remained a crowd pleaser to fans even today. In 1963, a fourth Fargo brother appeared, Joey. He worked the territory for a while before reverting to a more familiar name, Louis Tillett. Initially despised by the fans, the Fargos eventually became the territory's lead babyfaces whenever they appeared together. The fifth, and possibly the most well-known Fargo brother, was Johnny Fargo, who would later go on to become Greg the Hammer Valentine. It should also be noted that the Fargos are also not brothers in real life. Television was an integral part of the success Goulas enjoyed throughout the region. From the 1950s forward, the area had various forms of local televised wrestling. Many fans are well aware of the long-running TV show at a Memphis hosted for many years by arguably the greatest wrestling announcer ever, Lance Russell. Russell's ability to sell angles to fans, to lead young stars through interviews, and to communicate his disgust at the heinous acts of the bad guys, among his other talents, made him one of the area's most valuable performers over the years. He will be long remembered for his verbal jousting with Jerry Lawler. Russell eventually was paired with popular Memphis TV weatherman Dave Brown to form a long-running announcing duo. Russell, who worked in the Memphis TV industry for several years, eventually left that line of work and worked full-time as an announcer and behind the scenes in the wrestling promotion. Much of the eastern half of the territory was treated to the announcing of Harry Thornton. Thornton was a pioneer broadcaster in Chattanooga. 
He became involved with Goulas in the late 1950s and became a co-promoter in the Chattanooga area with Goulas. With Thornton's popularity from Chattanooga Radio, he added credibility and had a local feel to Goulas' efforts to succeed in the local area. However, Thornton understood his role in the business was to make the TV show exciting and to make the TV viewers care enough about what they saw to be willing to spend their money to see the live house shows that week. Thornton did not like wrestling heels and made no bones about it in his commentary and often in interviews with them. He often verbally sparred with the likes of Tojo Yamamoto and gentleman Saul Weingroff. Thornton also worked the TV show taped in Nashville over the years, adding his colorful personality to the show. Goulas also, at various times, had local TV shows produced in Birmingham and Huntsville, as well as in Jackson and Nashville, Tennessee. Goulas Birmingham announcer was Sterling Brewer. After the Atlanta office underwent some turmoil in late 1972, Brewer was hired as an interim announcer for the NWA Georgia office. He worked there a few weeks before a permanent replacement was chosen. Brewer was replaced by Gordon Soley, who became the voice of Georgia Championship Wrestling for the next decade. From time to time, a group would form and try and promote wrestling somewhere in the territory against the established Goulas. In the fall of 1972, Phil Golden opened up a promotion based out of Kentucky and ran several cities in opposition to Goulas, using stars such as Mike Pappas, Joe Ball and Bill Helm, Mario Gelanto, Paul Christie, Angelo Poffo, Pez Watley, Chico Cortez, and others. The promotion was based around longtime Goulas villains Kurt and Carl Von Bronner and their manager, gentleman Saul Weingroff, who left the Goulas promotion at the end of the summer of 1972. The promotion folded in the spring of 1973. It should be noted that Golden was the brother of Bill Golden, who opened up the Montgomery, Alabama territory in 1971. Bill Golden, the father of Jimmy Golden, had married into the famous Welsh family that had strong ties to the Goulas promotion. Also notable among those who tried to run opposition was Lee Fields. In 1974, Fields tried to promote opposite Goulas in Nashville. Lee had run the Gulf Coast promotion since 1958. Among the stars Fields used in his effort against Goulas was Jack Dalton, known to most Goulas fans as Don Fargo. What is interesting about this endeavor is that Fields had worked previously for Goulas, along with his brothers Don and Bobby. Bobby, as Luke Fields, had teamed with Don to become one of Goulas' most successful teams of the late 1950s and early 1960s. In reality, Lee, Don, and Bobby Fields were Lee, Don, and Bobby Hatfield, sons of Gulf Coast wrestling referee legend Virgil Speedy Hatfield. Most interesting of all, perhaps, in regards to this attempt to run opposite Goulas is that Speedy Hatfield was married to Bonnie Welsh, the sister of Goulas promoting partner Roy Welsh. There were other attempts to run opposition against Goulas, but Nick would survive them through the years. The future, though, would hold more opposition for Goulas from time to time. The Goulas territory, as most every territory, had a fairly wide array of recognized titles. Goulas was a member of the National Wrestling Alliance and over the years was able to secure dates with various NWA, World Heavyweight and World Junior Heavyweight Champions. Goulas had a number of titles regularly defended throughout the circuit. Among these were the World Tag Team titles, the Southern Junior Heavyweight title, the Southern Tag Team titles, the Mid-America Heavyweight title, the Mid-America Tag titles, and the U.S. Junior Heavyweight title. Before even discussing the various titles Goulas recognized, it is important to note that the territory became known over the years as a haven for great tag teams. For years, many Goulas cards were headlined with a tag team match, often for one of the area's top tag team titles. Over the years, Goulas also used many mass tag teams including Mephisto and Dante, the Mighty Yankees, the Blue Infernos, the Spoilers, the Interns, the Medics and others. Some say because mass teams grew great crowd response in the area, Goulas could book a mass team in two cities on the same night and have four different men wrestle under the masks. This would make it possible, for example, to have the Yankees appear in Memphis on Monday night, while a few hundred miles away in Birmingham, the Yankees were also headlining a card there. It goes without saying that Nick Goulas was a very shrewd promoter. It is ironic that Goulas rarely dropped the ball, but in the late 1960s and early 1970s, by failing to fully utilize one of the greatest mass tag teams ever, the Infernos, with manager J.C. Dykes. Dykes had refereed for Goulas for a number of years before becoming a manager, but had to leave the area to hit it big. 
The World Tag Team titles were held by such teams as Corsica Joe and Corsica Jean, Jackie and Don Fargo, Don and Al Green, Tex Riley and Len Rossi, Kurt and Carl Von Bronner, Lester and Herb Welsh, Eddie Graham and Sam Steamboat, Tojo Yamamoto and Alex Perez, The Blue Infernos, Billy and Jimmy Hines, Ken Lucas and Dennis Hall, Len Rossi and Bearcat Brown, Jackie Fargo and Jerry Jarrett, and the fabulous Kangaroos. Research indicates Gula stopped using the World Tag Team titles around 1974, although through the 1970s, a few teams have passed through the area from time to time claiming to be the World Tag Team Champions. The Southern Tag titles date back to the late 1940s. Champions over the years include Herb Welsh and Tex Riley, Roy Welsh and Eddie Gossett, Herb Welsh and Roy Welsh, Don and Luke Fields, Don Carson and the Red Shadow, Butnick Monroe and Norval Austin, and Terry and Ronnie Garvin. This title will continue to be defended consistently in the area through 1987. The Mid-America Tag Titles began to be defended in early 1972 by Len Rossi and Tony Charles. Other champions included Kurt and Carl Von Bronner, Don and Al Green, Len Rossi and Bearcat Brown, and the interns among others. This title was defended in the area through 1980. The Mid-America title was originally defended in the territory by the legendary Nature Boy Buddy Rogers in 1957. The title was defended until it fell inactive until around 1971 when Len Rossi was billed as champion. The title would become more prominent in the region in the mid and late 1970s and will continue to be defended until 1987. The United States Junior Heavyweight title was defended in Goulas territory over the years, most notably in the early 1970s. It is listed here primarily because the list of men who held the title is short but prestigious and includes Johnny Walker, Don Green, Lorenzo Perante, and the legendary Danny Hodge in the mid-1960s. The singles title that came to become the area's major title was the Southern Junior Heavyweight title. A list of champions included Herb Welsh, Ray Stevens, Freddie Blassie, Jackie Fargo, Jesse James, Len Rossi, Don Green, Sputnik Monroe, Tommy Gilbert, Ronnie Garvin, and Lou Thez, among others. Due to the area usually headlining shows with tag teams, this title wasn't as prominent during the 50s and 60s as it would become in the 1970s and 80s. The Southern Junior Heavyweight title would be renamed the Southern Heavyweight title in the summer of 1974. Major attractions such as Danny Hodge, Pat O'Connor, Eddie Graham, Buddy Fuller, Gene Kaniski, Haystack Calhoun, Johnny Valentine, Harley Race, and even Dory Funk Jr. also worked shows for Goulas during the decade. Goulas even used boxing legend Joe Lewis on cards as a special referee in various cities. Late in the 1960s, Goulas used Dr. Sam Shepard on cards teamed with longtime Goulas regular George Strickland. Shepard had been imprisoned after a murder trial heavily covered by the media. Errors were discovered in Shepard's first murder trial, so a retrial was ordered. In the second trial, Shepard was acquitted and released. The events of his life influenced the TV show The Fugitive and later a movie of the same name. Notable among those who made great impacts on the business later on who worked for Goulas in the 1960s include a man known in the territory as Ron Carson. Early in his career, the man left Texas and came to Tennessee to work for Nick Goulas. Not long after his arrival, he teamed with Tennessee native Don Carson as Don's brother and his team won the world tag title. In reality, Ron Carson was future international superstar Dick Murdoch. Murdoch was the son of wrestler Frankie Murdoch, famous in the Amarillo, Texas Territory. Sam Bass also debuted in the 1960s. Initially, he didn't make much of a splash for Goulas, appearing mainly as an undercard performer. He would, though, become a major star for Goulas in the 1970s as the manager of the team of Jim White and Jerry Lawler. Also appearing for Goulas were the True Life brother team of Ron and Don Wright, natives of Kingsport, Tennessee. Low-key Don and Motormouth Ron riled fans like few teams could. Ron, who often referred to himself as the number one hillbilly, had a run on the eastern half of the territory in 1969 that even featured him receiving a shot at the NWA world champion Dory Funk Jr. in Chattanooga when he and Don were billed as Ron and Don Hayes. Ron's ability to incite the fans during interviews was matched only by his ability to do the same through illegal tactics in the ring. Although the Wrights and fellow East Tennessee wrestling legend Whitey Caldwell mostly appeared in the Knoxville territory, Goulas would use them from time to time for several years, mainly on the eastern end of the territory. 
The 1960s were turbulent times for race relations in most southern cities. Several of the city's ghoulish ran cars were no exception, especially Memphis and Birmingham. Goulis had used African-American stars for many years, including a young man named Matt Jewell. In 1969, he changed his name to Bearcat Brown and debuted for Goulis and was given a major push. While Goulis had used African-Americans in the past, he had never had an African-American become a regular headliner throughout the territory. As Brown headlined cards in Goulis cities for years, he was often paired with such popular headliners as Don Carson, Johnny Walker, and Len Rossi. Conversely, in 1971, Goulis turned to the legendary Sputnik Monroe to introduce the territory's first regular African-American heel. Monroe, controversial and cocky, teamed with Norvell Austin to form the area's first successful integrated heel team. Monroe, who was known for his black hair with a blonde streak down the middle, saw to it that his new partner followed suit. Soon Monroe and Austin were one of the area's hottest heel team. They were so successful they toured other territories as well. Debuting in the early 1960s in the territory was a Japanese heel named Tojo Yamamoto. Yamamoto quickly became known as Sly and Evil, a stereotype from the World War II time period. In real life, Yamamoto was Harold Watanabe, a native Hawaiian. A short man, Yamamoto was a great ring psychologist and quickly became one of Gula's lead heels and would remain so for a long time. Even after a stint in the Carolinas for Jim Crockett where he appeared as P.Y. Chung and in Texas as T.Y. Chung, Yamamoto was likely the most disliked man in the Goulas territory for a good part of the 60s. And for those who follow the logic of wrestling, realize when a wrestler is utterly despised by the fans, it likely means he would someday make a great baby face. All that matters is timing. In late 1969, the time was right. Nick Goulas promoted a specific match area fans loved. The match was a Battle of the Brutes tag match. The fans loved this match because it pitted two teams they disliked against each other. The two teams were the Mass Spoilers and Tojo Yamamoto and Johnny Long. The match led to the fans sliding with Yamamoto and Long, so the crafty Yamamoto became a fan favorite. Yamamoto would then solidify his status as a true fan favorite when it was revealed in an angle that he was training with the popular babyface Jerry Jarrett. Jarrett was then destroyed by a group of heels which led Yamamoto rescuing Jarrett. Yamamoto even carried Jarrett out of the ring in his own arms to safety. This led Jarrett and Yamamoto teaming to face the heels who had tried to eliminate Jarrett. The fans, longtime vocal opponents of Yamamoto, then proudly cheered their new hero and its protege. The Yamamoto Jarrett tie was never forgotten by the promotion and was used in various ways through most of the 1980s. The early 1970s saw a business boom for Goulas. As mentioned earlier, Christine Jarrett became more involved in the business end of the company by helping open up and run shows in Kentucky and Indiana. Jerry Jarrett became more involved in the behind the scenes end of things by basically becoming co-promoter Roy Welsh's assistant. Jerry ended up booking the shows in Memphis, which became the city that drew the largest attendance week in and week out on the circuit. Major stars for Goulas during the early 1970s included Dr. Ken Ramey and the interns, Buddy Wayne, Big Bad John, Pepe Lopez, Sir Stephen Clements, Eddie Marlin, Tommy Gilbert, The Alaskans, The Samoans, Norvell Austin, Cowboy Frankie Lane, David and Jerry Novak, Bill Dromo, Ronnie Garvin, Terry Garvin, and The Fabulous Kangaroos. A young Kevin Sullivan also worked the territory for Goulas in the early 1970s. Around the same time another young man made his debut, he was known as Dennis McCord. He gained some further fame as Iron Mike McCord, but even greater fame several years later as Austin Idol. Many fans saw Idol feud with Sullivan in the early days of Atlanta's TV superstation WTBS. Sullivan would have a long successful career both in ring and behind the scenes. McCord would return to the area as Idol years later and become a major attraction for the promotion. Goulas' son George debuted in ring in 1973 as a special referee on cards throughout the territory. But by 1974, George, a tall thin man, made his debut as a wrestler and immediately was placed in prominent places on cards, teaming with such stars as Jerry Jarrett, Tojo Yamamoto and Jackie Fargo, the three biggest baby faces of the time for Goulas. One of these guys is not like the others, one of these guys just doesn't belong, can you tell which guy is not like the others? By the time I finish my song 
Also making their presence known in the early 1970s were the younger members of the Welsh family. Buddy Fuller's two sons, Ron and Robert, debuted. Buddy was the son of Goulas promoting partner Roy Welsh. Ron and Robert's cousin Jimmy Golden also worked the area as did Lester Welsh's two sons, Jackie and Roy Lee Welsh. Also appearing from time to time were Johnny and Ricky Fields, nephews to Roy Welsh. The Welsh family played a vital part of pro wrestling throughout the South for many decades. Not only was Roy Welsh part of a successful promotion with Nick Goulas, but other members of the Welsh family became part of the business of wrestling promotion. Lester Welsh had bought into the Florida wrestling office based in Tampa and operated by Cowboy Luttrell and Eddie Graham. Meantime, Edward Welsh, aka Buddy Fuller, bought into the Georgia wrestling office based in Atlanta along with Paul Jones, Fred Ward and Ray Gunkel. Gunkel and Fuller became one of the area's top tag teams of the 1960s. Away from the fans, Gunkel and Fuller often clashed how business should be conducted. In 1972, Buddy Fuller, wanting out of the consistent bickering with Gunkel, which no doubt included how his sons Robert and Ron would be used in the promotion, arranged a deal with his brother Lester. Lester would trade his Florida shares with Buddy's Georgia shares. Lester came to work in the Atlanta office while Buddy moved to work in the Florida office. Later in the year, one of the remaining owners of the Atlanta office, Ray Gunkel, sadly passed away. His part of the company fell to his wife, Anne. The Georgia office split when Anne Gunkel formed All South Wrestling and acquired much of the Atlanta-based talent. The one thing she did not take was the sanction of the National Wrestling Alliance, who had long, well-established ties to the Welsh family. The NWA sent in stars from around the country to assist Welsh in Atlanta. By January 1973, the NWA put into place a new team to help run the Atlanta office, complete with new booker Cowboy Bill Watts. Until late 1974, the NWA and All South Wrestling ran weekly wrestling cards against each other in many Georgia cities. Some of Gula's stars made appearances for both the NWA and Georgia, including Don Green, Jackie Fargo, Tojo Yamamoto, Jerry Jarrett, Ron and Robert Fuller, Jimmy Golden, and even a young Jerry Lawler. The NWA eventually won the war, and along the way, Welsh sold his part of the Atlanta promotion to Jim Barnett. Looking for a booker for Atlanta, Barnett approached Jerry Jarrett, who agreed to book Atlanta, but only if he could continue working for Goulas. Not long after this development, Jerry was approached by Goulas and Buddy Fuller about buying Roy Welsh's part of the promotion in Tennessee, since Roy's health was in decline. Jarrett bought into the Goulas promotion, and for a while all was well, as Goulas, Jarrett, and Buddy Fuller, serving largely as a silent partner, continued to give the fans what they wanted to see. Jerry Lawler made a name for himself in the Tennessee Territory in the 1970s. Lawler is truly a versatile performer. He ranks very high on the list of the business's best talkers. As he grew older, he became somewhat more cautious in ring of what he would do, but early in his career, Lawler was one of the best bump takers in the business. Discovered by Jackie Fargo at a Memphis radio station, Lawler worked for Goulas as an undercard performer. Lawler was advised to gain some more experience by working a territory that had just opened. The territory was based in Montgomery, Alabama and was opened by Bill Golden, father of Jimmy Golden. Jimmy was a grandson of Goulas partner Roy Welsh, while in Alabama, Lawler teamed with Steve Lawler, who was no relation. While there, Jerry came into contact with veterans Jim White and Sam Bass. Jim White and Roy Klein were working the area as the Green Shadows. When they were unmasked, they were billed as Woodrow and Roy Bass. Sam Bass was then brought in as their manager. Roy soon left and was replaced by Jimmy Hydes, working as Percy Bass. White eventually went to work for Goulas and Lawler soon followed. Eventually, White and Lawler teamed and added Jim Kent as their manager before Bass took over the honours. This team would become trouble for Nick Goulas' babyfaces beginning in 1972. Lawler's talents reached beyond the wrestling ring as he drew a cartoon strip called The Patriot for the Wrestling Monthly magazine in the early 1970s. As the history of this territory unfolds, Jerry Lawler played an increasingly bigger role, but by 1974, just three years after his debut, he was already poised to become the territory's top star. The partnership between Nick Goulas and Jerry Jarrett was on shaky ground as the year started. 
Cards always sold out, but Goulas was insisting that his son George be used more prominently. The uneasy truce between both sides wouldn't last much longer. During the early part of the year, it seemed to be business as usual in the territory. Though there were some ongoing power struggles, Booker Jerry Jarrett still refused to use George Goulas on the more profitable western end of the territory. The last Memphis card promoted by Nick Goulas and Jerry Jarrett together under the Goulas Welsh promotional banner was a card that was headlined by a Southern Tag Team Tournament. The following week, WMC-TV, the station which had first shown TV wrestling in Memphis dating back to 1949, began airing a Jarrett promoted show with local TV personalities Clay Conrad and Bob Young as hosts. WMAQ-TV had been the home of studio wrestling in Memphis since 1958. Until the split, the TV show was hosted by Lance Russell and Dave Brown. Despite the changes, Jarrett didn't miss a beat in 1977 as he promoted a card at the Cook Convention Center on Sunday, March 20th, headlined with Jerry Lawler battling Bob Armstrong. On the undercard were such favorites as Bill Dundee, Phil Hickerson and Dennis Condry and others. Also making the show were Knoxville area regulars Ron and Robert Fuller and Kurt and Carl Von Bronner. Goulas did not want to give up the profitable western end without a fight, even if it meant promoting without a talented booker such as Jarrett. He booked the Mid-Southern Coliseum for the regular Monday night show and headlined the card with one of the greatest feuds of the 1970s, The Sheik vs. Bobo Brazil. It was still early in the game, but indications after the first Memphis battle proved to be a barometer of things to come. The Jarrett card drew well, while the Goulas card drew three times less than what Goulas and Jarrett drew together. Goulas tried a few other cards in Memphis over the next few weeks, as he seemingly would have the edge by using long-term stars Jackie Fargo and Tojo Yamamoto. Ironically, both Fargo and Yamamoto were Jarrett's most frequent tag partners, and away from the ring, the trio were real-life friends. But business was business. Fargo and Yamamoto stuck with Goulas, leaving Jarrett to build his promotion without the area's legends. Jarrett kept pushing on and over time, the western half of the territory fell to him, including Memphis, Louisville, Evansville and Lexington, as Goulas hung on to the eastern end, Nashville, Chattanooga, Birmingham and Huntsville. The fight was a little tougher in Kentucky, as Goulas took Jarrett to court over promoting there. The court threw out Goulas' claims to keeping Jarrett out of Kentucky, saying that whoever wanted to promote wrestling there could, as long as he obeyed the laws of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. No one really knows why Jarrett won the Western End so quickly. TV certainly played a role as Jarrett eventually orchestrated the addition of longtime announcing team Lance Russell and Dave Brown from WHBQ where Russell and Brown had both worked and where the TV show had aired for years. Russell was in programming at the time while Brown was a meteorologist. The moves made a few weeks after the split helped the audience to tune into familiar faces week after week and absorb the shock of the TV show jumping from one station to another. Jarrett's product was simply more exciting at this point. He hung on to Lawler, who had turned into the area's top stars, while Goulas main star Jackie Fargo worked a limited schedule, and another main star, Tojo Yamamoto, worked tag matches with George Goulas. Lawler, in turn, was in the midst of a feud with Rocky Johnson, who had captured the fans' imaginations with his charisma and dynamic ring ability. The feud served as something more attractive than Goulas offering the Sheik vs. Bobo Brazil, a feud featuring two wrestlers area fans had seen very little through the years, which meant their match did not mean as much to the fans at this point. Jared also had the blessing and financial support of Buddy Fuller, and by extension Fuller's father and area legend Roy Welsh. It's quite possible that many wrestlers who didn't like to deal with Goulas didn't mind working for someone representing the Welsh family. Jarrett won the battle. A truce was apparently assumed as the two promotions mostly stayed on their newly cut turf for the rest of the year and tried to establish their own distinctive styles. Things would never be the same. Ron Fuller had bought the Knoxville office in 1974 and had weaned it off Goulas supplied cars by creating a new unique territory called Southeast Championship Wrestling. Now that Jarrett had branched out on his own, he had acquired a huge hunk of territory, including the very profitable city of Memphis. Nick Goulas had stuck with his guns and insisted his son George be pushed as a main eventer. With the split between the two ends of the territory came to the re-emergence of the area's top star Jackie Fargo. Fargo had cut back on his in-ring appearances in the previous few years. In a very real sense, he had passed the torch off to Jerry Lawler. It is also interesting to note that Andre the Giant made appearances for both Jarrett and Goulas during the time frame, often one night for Jarrett and the following night for Goulas. 
Andre, booked by Vince McMahon of the WWWF, had apparently been booked for weeks or months prior to the fallout between Goulas and Jarrett. In 1977, Nick Goulas turned to Detroit for help and several Detroit Matt stars came to work for Goulas. For many years, the Detroit territory was a major stopover by professional wrestling. By 1977, there was a talent pipeline as the territory was in serious decline. The fans there had been treated to various no-shows and rip-off finishes. While they still drew some decent crowds on occasion, their glory days seemed to be behind them. The shows were usually headlined by one of the business's great villains, the Sheik, perennial U.S. champion, who began defending the title fairly frequently in the area for Goulas. Soon to follow was a team of Angelo and Lanny Poffo. This combination had laid claim to the Detroit World Tag Team titles for a while. In some locations, this team was billed as the Poffo brothers. In reality, Angelo was Lanny's father. By the year's end, the two territories were coexisting fairly peacefully, but that wouldn't last. 1978 had been a year when both Nick Goulas and Jerry Jarrett tried to invade the other's territory. Both failed. As 1979 started, things hadn't changed. Jarrett relied on tested talent from other territories, while Goulas used longtime star Tojo Yamamoto as a heel and headlined with young talent such as George Goulas, among others. The heels of that year saw Nick Goulas and Jerry Jarrett patch up their differences enough to work together in 1980. 1980 seemed to be a year where the sky was the limit. Good intentions and well thought out scenarios though often go sour when something unexpected occurs. Such a monkey wrench will be thrown into the mix in 1980 when an important part of the territory, Jerry Lawler, suffered a serious injury. Promoter Jerry Jarrett would work to fill this gap all year long. With Goulas insistent on pushing his son and CWA becoming very popular led to a drop with ticket sales and by 1981, Goulas closed his promotion and sold the territory and its championships to the CWA. That was the untold story of NWA Mid-America. One of these guys is not like the others. One of these guys just doesn't belong. Can you tell which guy is not like the others? By the time I finish my song. Did you guess which guy was not like the others? Did you guess which guy just doesn't belong? If you guess this guy is not like the others.